even within the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, Animal sacrifice is controversial, so there are prophets saying you shouldn't do this anymore. When you kill an ox, it's as bad as killing a human being. Um, the prophets say, you know, the, and God doesn't want all of this animal sacrifice. Please stay tuned to our program to find out more. Welcome to today's show, where we will continue hearing from the distinguished panelists about how the respective religions uphold the universal truth of kindness toward all sentient beings. Warning, you might find the content herein disturbing, but the truth must be revealed. On October 27, 2019, a discussion titled Faith Panel on the Relationship Between Religion and Veganism, which took place in London, England, explored the interrelations between spiritual beliefs and cruelty-free plant-based living. It was organized as part of London's VegFest UK, one of the biggest annual vegan festivals in Great Britain, dedicated to celebrating, expanding and relishing with gusto the life-affirming vegan trend. Among the panelists were scholars and activists from diverse religious backgrounds. Lara Balsam, director of the Jewish Vegetarian Society, Mara White, Muslim animal rights activist, Krishna Gandhi, Hindu animal rights activist, Dr. David Clough, Methodist preacher and professor of theological ethics at the University of Chester, Reverend Janie Hiller, ordained minister and pioneer activist in the Anglican Diocese of Bristol, along with panel chair Trey Kelly, an anthropologist and PhD student at Manchester University. Each of the individuals in this respectable group of advocates reached the conclusion that being vegan is an essential aspect of following their respective holy scriptures. Moreover, it is the only way to truly live in harmony with the spiritual values of virtue and compassion. These panel members discuss how they came to realize that our concern for the welfare of animals lies at the very heart of any religious belief and thus should ideally be a top priority for any person of faith. So in Islam we have something uh, which involves animal sacrifice, which is Eid. And um, so the whole point of animal sacrifice on that day is kind of to commemorate what uh, Prophet Ibrahim did for God when God tested his uh, loyalty. There are other ways that you can uh, celebrate Eid and make sacrifices without m making it an animal sacrifice. You can sacrifice your time, your money. It doesn't have to be an animal. It's a personal sacrifice that is important. Even within the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, Animal sacrifice is controversial, so there are prophets saying you shouldn't do this anymore. When you kill an ox, it's as bad as killing a human being. Um, the prophets say, you know, the, and God doesn't want all of this animal sacrifice. So even within that, uh, those texts, you've got that. And then in, in, a, in a modern context, I think we can recognize that, well, after the first century, neither Jews or Christians are sacrificing. Um, and so in a modern religious context, in uh, Christianity and Judaism, that isn't the question. And so the question is whether or not anymore we need to consider Consume animals in this way, and I think the answer in, in the context where we find ourselves now is, is clearly no. Let's take a short while to write down an appetizing vegan meal plan for the coming week. We'll be right back after an important message here on Supreme Master Television. Welcome back, peace-bringing viewers. Spiritual masters throughout the ages have been living examples of compassion and non-violence. Let's hear from the expert advocates how these enlightened principles are being applied in today's religions. So the kind of outreach that I do is I'll take part in the Cube of Truth and they've got footage of halal slaughterhouses as well as other slaughterhouses. So. Um, I'll show Muslims that this is not just in regards to non-halal meat, it's also the meat that you're eating as well. There's cruelty in uh, all meat production, not just non-halal. Another thing that I do is 
Whenever I take part in marches now, I'll always have my sign showing religion in it as well. So the quote that I read out earlier, a good deed done to an animal is like a good deed done to a human being. I put that on um, a banner when I did my first uh, animal rights march in London last year. And then I also attended a anti-vivisection march in Oxford a few months back. And on there I just wrote vivisection is haram which it is so pretty straightforward things like that so then muslims who are walking by they will see that this is like relates to muslims as well and um my latest banner just said um our prophet would condemn the meat egg and dairy industry go vegan so i'll do things like that yeah also if i see um muslims taking part in specific marches such as like recently at the climate change protest, I saw some Muslims and then I went up to them and asked them if they eat meat and they said yes. So that was my opportunity to um, advocate to them about how uh, eating meat contributes to climate change. So if they care about climate change, and then that's something that they can do. In terms of it being related to the faith and community, um, we see that we have a prime minister in India right now um, who has stopped or illegalized the slaughter of cows. So that's a big deal. I mean, he has challenged uh, the status quo. He has challenged a lot of things that are happening there. Um, he's taking a very strong and tough stance. So, uh, I mean, he really puts a lot of hope. Uh, as a politician, it's probably, for me, like a miracle, but um, he really is doing great things. I sort of am angry about what we're doing um, in relation to climate, animals and uh, human uh, injustices at the moment. I want to see change uh, really quickly. I'm sort of grieving about the suffering and death that we're uh, causing uh, across uh, the whole of the creaturely uh, world at the moment. And I'm trying to find ways uh, in whatever level I can to have sort of maximal uh, impact on changing uh, attitudes and practice. But the thing I think we might really want to dwell with as we think about the relationship between veganism and religious traditions is how religious traditions could be a resource for veganism and a wider activist movement for the spirituality of what you need to sustain and engage uh, change. So how do we keep a vision of hope in the context of what seem like overwhelming uh, catastrophes that seem really hard uh, to influence? I think religious traditions have got uh, some really important resources. How how do we sustain good communities in the context of, you know, wider crisis and sea level rise and uh, real challenges um, as we deal with sort of, uh, you know, the need to maintain places which are hospitable to refugees in the context where we're going to have a whole lot more refugees. And so we may need other virtues other than kind of impatience and uh, em emotions like anger too. And so I want to channel my impatience and anger and also recognize that to sustain the change we need, we're also going to need uh, love and grace and patience and humility in order to sustain the kind of communities that we're going to need in the crisis that we're facing. I'm an academic at the University of Chester, professor of Christian ethics there. And so the primary uh, initial form of my advocacy was uh, writing academic stuff. So I've just finished this two-volume work on Christian uh, theology and ethics of animals. And I think that's pl uh, helping to play a small role in shaping the academic discussion of Christian theology, which is a kind of long-term strategy for shaping wider Christian attitudes. But I'm impatient with, to, to get results a bit sooner than that as well. Um, so about four years ago, I set up an organization called Creature Kind, working to raise farmed animal welfare as an issue among Christians. It's a new non-profit we've set up in the States and uh, in the UK. Uh, and we're doing lots of things like uh, providing a, a free course for Christian small groups to use on Christianity animals, educational resources. Um, and we're also working on food policy with lots of Christian institutions saying, OK, if you think like us that Christians are got reasons for caring about animals, then can we help advise how you're going to reduce consumption of farmed animals and move to higher welfare uh, sourcing in your institutional food policy? Um, I'm also working on a government um, UK Research Council funded project on the Christian ethics of farmed animal welfare in partnership with major UK churches. Uh, so that's another way that I'm trying to raise farmed animal welfare as a, a, an issue for Christians and we're producing a policy framework which I hope will inform the practice of churches and other institutions. 
I don't think you can really underestimate the power of habitual living and the challenge to change is focused around that identification and the nearness of the consequences of those habits. And at the moment, we have uh, a huge distance between the habit of eating meat and the reality of what happens in farming and intensive farming, even just calling it meat and not cow or pig or chicken. So there's something about the proximity of the consequences of our actions which makes us immune to, to, to kind of t coming out of our habitual ways of doing things. So I think there is always... Uh, a role for people who want to open up those conversations and kind of prick the little bubbles of people's um, habits and help them to maybe think critically about the way that they go about life. Enlightened viewers, thank you for earnestly supporting the responsibility we share for our impact on God's creatures and the planet. Please join us again tomorrow for the final part of this series on Words of Wisdom.